Welcome and thank you for allowing me to come into your homes today to um, chat to you about um, nutrition and lifestyle um, strategies for endometriosis. Um, so, you know, I think um, at the moment everybody's going through um, quite a lot. It's quite a, a crazy time for all of us. Um, and, you know, but I think one thing um, I hope you get from today, like there's going to be a lot of content I'm going to be um, taking you through today. Um, but also, you know, um, I think one thing um, I hope you sort of learn from today is that, you know, when we're actually looking after ourselves and looking after or treating endo, like using uh, nutrition, um, the good thing is, is that we're also really supporting our immune system. And so I think, you know, a lot of us, I think we kind of realise that that's pretty important at the moment. Um, given that we're in the middle of this um, COVID-19 pandemic. So, yeah, so I hope you're all okay um, and, you know, staying safe at the moment. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just start to um, just take you through some of my slides now. So we've got a lot of content um, to cover. So um, grab a pen and paper. And um, just take as many notes um, as you can, because I, as I said, I will be covering um, a lot of content today. So, and I will, um, you know, like touch base with you guys as well at the end, um, just to see if you've got any questions. And you can also type questions in, um, I think. This is actually the first time I've done a presentation on, on Zoom. So this workshop was actually meant to be live. So um, forgive me in advance if there's any technical difficulties. So, yeah, so grab a pen and paper and I'll just quickly tell you a little bit about me. Um, so I um, was diagnosed with um, endometriosis about seven years ago. And I, um, yeah, so I've got stage four endo. I've also got adenomyosis and, um, yeah, so it was quite severe. Um, I was in a pretty bad way and I've had three surgeries. Two of them were pretty major. I've had a bowel resection and also pretty much lost most of one of my kidneys. So um, yeah, so that really sparked, I have a corporate, more of a corporate background, but it really sparked an interest um, in nutrition and um, with me. So that's why I went back to uni to study nutrition um, because what I've really found is um, diet like for me has made a huge impact on my overall health. Um, so thankfully, you know, I've been um, quite well for the last six years, which, you know, which I'm, I'm feeling I'm quite, I'm quite lucky um, about. So yeah, so this is kind of what we're going to be covering today. So we're just going to be um, chatting about, um, you know, I'm just going to cover some of the driving or underlying factors with adenomyosis and endometriosis. Um, and also we'll be talking about gut health, um, also therapeutic diets, um, supplements, lifestyle, which is really important. Um, I, yeah, I find that lifestyle factors and managing stress is really, really important. So um, I'll be covering just a couple of slides on that. And then I've also got some resources for you guys and it's a chance to also ask um, some questions as well. All right, so um, just a, a couple of points about me and how I work. So I'm an evidence-based nutritionist, but I also take a holistic approach um, to treatment. So try and treat the whole person, not, you know, just the disease. Um, so I take a, you know, food as medicine approach um, that's really tailored to the individual. And I really believe that food should be a source of pleasure. So even if you have a chronic illness, even if you know, you, you are on a restricted diet, I think we, you know, we can make it um, pleasurable. So they're, they're sort of, that's sort of the way I like to work. So just to touch on adenomyosis. So it is um, Adenomyosis um, Awareness Month. So I thought I'd start with this. Um, so adenomyosis is where cells that normally line the uterus um, actually grow into the muscle of the uterus, so into the myometrium. So the main symptoms are pelvic pain, bloating, heavy bleeding, or, you know, it can also um, affect fertility as well. Um, so um, about 42% of women with ADNO also have endometriosis. Um, and, 
Yeah, so it seems to be there's definitely a relationship there. So it's it's a very high percentage. And it's, you know, like with endometriosis, it's a progressive, it's a chronic inflammatory condition, and it's also estrogen dependent. So they are very, very similar conditions. And so a lot of the treatments today that I'll be talking about um, are actually, um, you know, they're actually viable for both conditions. Um, and there's certain supplements that I especially like to use for both conditions, and I will chat to you guys about those. Um, so about endo, so we, we don't know the exact cause of endometriosis, but what we do know is that genetics um, and the environment, so when I say the environment, I mean things like pesticides, so um, certainly like toxins like um, dioxin um, have been implicated. So um, we know it is not a hormonal disease, however, it is fueled by estrogen. And we also know that our gut seems to play a role. So there's a lot more emerging evidence coming out now about the role of our gut health and specifically our microbiome, which is the microbiome of all our gut bugs, essentially. So our bacteria, our you know, um, yeast, things like that, which um, are part of our, our gut. Um, so it also seems to play a role and I'll, I'll delve into that as well. So, now, the, the disease is, so it is a disease of immune dysfunction and chronic inflammation. So this, um, this immune dysregulation um, or activation of the immune system promotes this chronic inflammation. So it's like this vicious cycle that goes around. So inflammation itself is not a bad thing. We need that in the body. It's a normal physiological response. However, you know, when we have this vicious cycle of inflammation, that's when it's bad and that's when it starts to affect all of our tissues. Um, and it also um, promotes something called angiogenesis. And it's really all it means is new blood vessels um, that run into the lesion. So they help um, really for the lesions to grow and uh, it really promotes the disease to get worse. So the lesions produce these pro-inflammatory cells, um, which stimulates angiogenesis. So just on the immune system still, now some things that have anti-angiogenic properties um, and also anti-inflammatory. Firstly, one is progesterone. So progesterone um, is a um, hormone. It's kind of estrogen's friend, I guess you could say. Um, and we really need it for pregnancy. And so what's um, found in a lot of women with endo is really low levels of progesterone. And we're not completely sure why this happens, but one factor is definitely um, or seems to be inflammation. And so progesterone has a lot of great qualities. So it actually helps to thin the uterine um, lining and it's, it's anti-inflammatory as well and it helps promote um, mood. So it's really great for mood. So, um, yeah, so progesterone is one of these things. Um, so vitamin A um, seems to be really great for its anti-angiogenic, um, really important for the immune system. And you can see on the slide there um, that um, I've listed a few um, foods that contain vitamin A. So things like, you know, um, meats, fish, eggs contain the active form of vitamin A and then fruits and veggies and things have got the pro-vitamin A, which needs to be converted. And so then we've also got, um, so foods high in polyphenols, um, which are, you know, things like olive oil, cacao, um, berries, green tea, all things, you know, with high in antioxidants, you would have heard that are, are really great to eat. And so I've just popped another note um, on the bottom of the slide there that, you know, these treatments support immune health. So this is really um, beneficial and relevant, especially right now as we're going through um, this health crisis with COVID-19. All right, so oxidative stress. So I'm not sure if any of you guys would have heard of this term, but women with, with endometriosis have seen to have increased levels of oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is this imbalance between antioxidants and free radicals. So you would have heard of antioxidants. Um, and so, you know, that we really get antioxidants through our diet. Um, and so antioxidants, 
what they do is they prevent free radicals from going around and stealing electrons from other molecules, which cause, causes damage, essentially, it causes tissue damage and inflammation. So yeah, so the, the good news is that diet, you know, is where we can get our antioxidants from. So it's really helpful. Okay, so let's just jump on to gut health now and just explore why this is um, really important for endo and what some of the latest research has shown. So um, the gut is important overall for our health because um, it turns out, you know, a good proportion of our serotonin, which is a chemical that's really um, involved in mood regulation. Um, so serotonin, so about 90% of serotonin is actually produced in our gut. So if our gut is health is compromised, then it can affect the production of these certain types of chemicals. Um, so also around about 60% of our immune health or our immune system is housed in our gut as well. And of course, our gut is where our nutrient absorption happens. So again, if you're not digesting food properly, um, then, you know, it can have an impact on the nutrients you, that you absorb and even like a really small um, deficiency in certain micronutrients can really have a, a large overall impact on your health. So um, the next point I've got is liver detoxification. So liver detoxification is so important and it's a part of our digestive system. And liver, um, liver detoxification, that is where we process all of our hormones. And so we know that endo is dependent on estrogen so, you know, we don't want excess free estrogen running through the body. So what we want is we really want to be um, eliminating um, estrogen and have our digestive system working efficiently. Now, my third point um, is about the microbiome. Um, so, you know, all of our gut bacteria. And this, the microbiome can actually influence our immune system and our central nervous system. So, um, and so when I say the central nervous system, I mean our brain. So it's really quite amazing. There's this crosstalk that happens between um, our gut bacteria and our brain. So it's called the gut brain axis. Um, and there's all, you know, nerves as well that connect the brain to the gut. All right, so still on gut health. So IBS, you guys have probably heard of that. Um, so IBS or irritable bowel syndrome is common in endometriosis and quite often actually women with endo get misdiagnosed so often they're told oh you've got IBS when you know actually they've got endometriosis but yeah the two sort of do go hand in hand as well and so both conditions share this chronic low-grade um, inflammation, so this perpetual cycle of low-grade inflammation. They both um, share pain, so you get this abdominal pain and something called dysbiosis. And dysbiosis is really um, an imbalanced microbiome. So you might have too much of a certain type of bacteria or, you know, there can be you know, a range of things going on there. Um, and then also you've got um, intestinal permeability or something called leaky gut. Some of you might have heard of that one. Um, so leaky gut, and I'll just explain. So there's a, an image there um, on the slide. And so leaky gut syndrome. So this picture here shows all of the cells that line the intestine. So, and all of the cells normally join together nice and tight um, with tight junctions and but what can happen if the gut is inflamed or we've got this situation of chronic inflammation is we start to see these gaps between the cells and so what happens is proteins from certain foods which normally wouldn't go through in between the cells um, actually go through the in between the cells and make their way into the bloodstream and then you see this whole like this is something that shouldn't happen Right, so we see this whole range of effects and it's linked to a whole range of conditions, um, leaky gut. So, you know, you start to see food intolerances. So you can no longer, you know, eat certain foods or you're reacting to lots of different types of food. You start to see systemic inflammation. So, you know, which can affect you in a whole lot of different ways. You feel fatigued, um, you know, maybe you start to get depression 
Um, it's also linked to various autoimmune diseases. Um, so yeah, so we start to see a whole range of effects there. And, and this has been associated, this condition's been associated with IBS and with endometriosis as well. Um, so just in terms of the microbiome, so I touched on just before that it can influence um, the immune system. And so what we also start to see and what you know, research has shown is that women with endo seem to have higher levels of something called lipopolysaccharides or LPS. So LPS for short. So um, LPS is like a toxin that comes from bacteria and it really promotes inflammation. So it's pro-inflammatory and it seems to promote the growth of lesions. And so the theory is, so this hasn't been confirmed through um, scientific research, but the theory is that um, it actually moves, this LKS moves from the gut to the pelvic cavity. And this, you know, it's, it's believed that it, this happens because of this leaky gut um, phenomenon. And so also what happens with, um, you know, in women with endo, we see high levels of a type of bacteria. There's a few different species, but one of them is E. coli. And E. coli release this toxin called LPS, and it also causes an increase in circulating estrogen as well. So there definitely, I guess what all of this means is that there is definitely a link between gut health between the microbiome and endometriosis. So, but there's just more and more research coming out all of the time. Um, okay. So, all right, so let's jump on now to how we can start to improve our health. So what are the things that we can do? And we'll just talk about gut health, first of all. So number one, my number one tip is to address food intolerances because food intolerances um, are really going to be contributing to that inflammatory situation in the gut. They're going to be making your symptoms a lot worse. So then we've got um, fibre. So we need fibre. That's the really the main source of fuel for the microbiome. So fibre is really great for your gut bugs and it's really good for lowering oestrogen. So um, fiber is important. So a balanced whole foods diet, and I'll get into the nitty gritty, the actual details of what you know the diet should actually look like. And I'll also just mention about prebiotics and probiotics. So there's there's always um, lots of talk about this um, in the media. So just to explain to you guys, so prebiotics are essentially it's fuel for your microbiome and prebiotics are found in a wide range of whole foods so fruit and veggies um, certain whole grains as well so um, prebiotics are great and probiotics so probiotics you can find in fermented foods things like kimchi things like kefir as well um, yeah so there's lots of you know but it's but you can also get specific strains so certain strains of probiotics as well which can help with different things so uh, the other thing is to move your body. So movement's really important. I know that's really hard if you're dealing with pain, but even just some sort of gentle movement. So, you know, and just find what works for you. Um, and as well, like, I mean, digestion starts in the mouth. And I think this is, you know, often missed or overlooked by um, many of us. Um, it just, we just need to chew our food. So stop. Don't eat in front of the computer. Don't try and wolf down your lunch. Like take some time, sit down and chew your food slowly and it will really help with digestion. Um, okay, another one there, another point actually, which I don't have in my slides is to drink plenty of water as well, because that will help, especially if you're constipated. So water is really important. So the principles for, um, for diet for endometriosis. So number one, um, and really this is for adenomyosis as well. So number one, eat a whole foods diet, an anti-inflammatory diet. And you know we want lots of antioxidants. We want to have lots of plant-based foods. Okay, so I'll, I will break this down even further in the next few slides. 
So we want to support estrogen metabolism and detoxification, like I mentioned before, through fiber. We want to improve our gut health. So just, you know, on the previous slide, so addressing food intolerances, those sorts of things. Um, and lifestyle. So stress is going to make everything worse. Stress um, really um, reduces your ability to digest food properly. Um, so you need to be in a relaxed state to actually digest your food and assimilate, you know, all of the nutrients from that food. Um, you know, so stress really impacts everything. So that's a, a really, you know, I can't stress that enough, um, how important it is. And I'll touch on that a little bit later, um, or just around strategies for that. All right, so diet. So what to include? So we want to aim for at least five serves of veggies daily. So one serve of veggie. So if you're talking, you know, we're thinking, I don't know, carrots and broccoli, things like that. Half a cup is one serve. That's one serve of vegetables. So if you're talking about leafy greens like salad, you know, spinach, lettuce, then you want one full cup. And, you know, ideally we want to include cruciferous veggies. Um, so you guys might have heard of this one. So we want to include broccoli and cabbage, things like that, cauliflower, because um, they're really great for, you know, promote um, estrogen detoxification, really great for the liver. Um, but, you know, for some of us, um, that is not going to work. Um, cruciferous veggies can actually flare up your symptoms. So, and that's more relating to, you know, um, certain foods called um, FODMAPs, foods that are high in FODMAPs. So um, I'll touch on that again a little bit later. So, um, yeah, so, and fill up a good rule of thumb is to fill up half your plate with veggies. And so for lunch and dinner. So that's just a good way, you know, good way to sort of gauge if you're getting enough vegetables. So, so two serves of, serves of fruit a day um, as well. And we want to try and aim for three serves of fish um, or shellfish a week. And I've got some examples there on the slides, like sardines, anchovies, um, you know, salmon, tuna, and tinned is totally fine. Tinned is absolutely fine. And, um, you know, these not only are, are these things, you know, they're a great source of protein, you know, they're high in certain nutrients like zinc, um, as well, but they're high in omega-3 fatty acids. And um, I'll talk about that um, omega-3s, you know, in terms of the supplements. Um, but yeah, but it's always best to try and get um, these nutrients through the diet where you can. And then, you know, the supplements are sort of the icing on the cake, I guess, um, giving you that therapeutic dose. Um, so, and just water. So just, um, you know, at least two litres of water a day, um, I'd say so, you know, eight glasses of water, depending on how much exercise you do. Okay, so what to include, um, continue. So we want whole grains, so not refined grains, you know, trying to stay away from breads and things like that. Like bread's fine, I'm not saying don't eat bread, but try and, you know, when you eat grains, if you can, just try and opt for whole grains. So, you know, brown rice, quinoa, um, millet, things like that. Um, so we want to increase fiber and I've just popped a few examples there. So flaxseed, especially ground flaxseed is great. Um, psyllium, um, chia seeds, really nice source of soluble fiber. Um, and also, beautiful spices so I can't recommend these highly enough um, turmeric ginger rosemary especially it's great for estrogen metabolism um, cinnamon and cacao so high in um, you know certain um, micronutrients and antioxidants very anti-inflammatory so um, I definitely recommend a turmeric latte so if you guys you know some of you might already be on to this it's been a bit of a trend for a few years now but um, yeah, it's a really nice way to increase your turmeric intake. So green tea, um, so rosemary, lemon and ginger tea. So just, you know, just adding um, some rosemary, fresh rosemary, and just adding it to lemon and ginger tea um, is just a really nice way to um, add some rosemary in because it is so great for your liver. Um, and also herbs. So just try and add herbs to everything is basically my recommendation. So herbs are just so good for you. Um, olive oil and avocado oil, they're really nice um, oils to 
add for, um, you know, just to add into um, for your cooking. And also just to, now I'm just going to touch on to what to limit or what to avoid. So, you know, I think a lot of these you guys will be across, but I'm just going to touch on them anyway. So sugar, processed foods, processed meats, things like salami, please avoid that. Limit red meat um, intake to once a week um, and opt for grass fed. Um, so some people sort of say you need to avoid red meat completely. I don't agree with that. Um, I think that, you know, if you, I think it is okay to leave um, red meat in your diet. I mean, obviously, you know, if you feel like it creates issues for you, then of course avoid it. Um, but the studies on red meat and endometriosis in those studies, if you look at those studies, the research, they're actually eating a whole lot of red meat, so very, very high amounts. So all I'm talking about here is like one serve of red meat once a week. So it's totally up to you, but you know, if you're vegan or vegetarian, then you know, that's fine. You don't have to eat red meat at all. So um, alcohol and coffee. So, you know, just try to limit that where you can um, limit fried foods, you know, processed foods, you know, limit your high amounts of saturated fat, which is mainly in processed foods. It's mainly in meat. Um, saturated fats also in you know things like cheese as well so just trying not to go overboard there um, consider gluten and cow's dairy um, this is a really common food intolerance for women with endometriosis i see it with my patients um, and you know there is some research around it as well um, particularly more so on gluten um, so yeah so just it's really about what what works for you Okay, I just wanted to touch on soy because there seems to be a lot of um, confusion. I see it on social media, media, people saying, no, you should not eat soy. And then some people are eating soy. Um, so I thought I'd just cover and just share what the research says. So soy is mildly estrogenic. So it's got phytoestrogens in it, um, which are known as isoflavones. But on the other side, phytoestrogens can also be um, anti-estrogenic. So, um, you know, so some studies, so animal studies have shown that um, soy can promote lesion growth. However, I would say this is very low evidence because animals, and then it's mostly rat studies, um, animals have a different physiology to humans. It's not, comp it's not really that relevant. Um, so there was one population-based study um, that showed that soy is associated with an increased risk of endometriosis. Um, but there were also two human studies that found soy um, to be linked to a reduced risk of endometriosis. So really the research is actually mix, mixed. There's no definitive answer. Um, so I would sort of say to people that um, if you want to eat soy, then you know, eat soy, but um, try and stick to organic soy, like the traditionally made soy products, things that, you know, ja the Japanese eat like tempeh, um, miso, that sort of thing. And just, you know, perhaps don't go too overboard with how much you consume. All right. So just touching now on environmental toxins. So look, I mean, we know that it is best to go organic where you can. Um, I know that this is not always possible. It can be very expensive to eat organic. So what I would suggest is if you can just try and get the dirty dozen organic, you know, um, and I've listed some of the um, items there. I'm not sure if this list has been updated though. I grabbed that list a few months ago. So you can always just jump onto the internet and check. Um, yeah, so things like strawberries, spinach, kale, they're actually quite highly sprayed. Um, so if you can get those organic, that's great. Um, so avoid heating your food in plastic containers um, and also just think about what you're putting on your skin, your moisturisers, your beauty products, yeah, because your skin absorbs all of that um, and then your liver and, you know, your body needs to process those chemicals. So we, we really don't want to be placing any excess pressure on the body. Okay, so fasting. Now, I love fasting um it's shown to have there's no i couldn't find any actual studies on fasting and endometriosis um but we've seen we can see that it offers a range of benefits and it seems to reduce um, inflammatory markers so i don't think that fasting needs to be um 
I don't think you need to fast and do this extreme fasting for like 24 hours or, you know, do cleanses and things like that. Like you don't need to do that. The benefits have really been shown when people fast anywhere between 13 hours and 15 hours. So you can just fast overnight. So just to have your last meal at, you know, 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. and then just fast through till, you know, like 8 a.m. or something, 9 a.m. the next morning. So that's what I would, I would suggest because constant eating, um, when we're constantly eating, it actually is a source of stress on the body. Like we need to eat, but the body also actually needs to have a break. Um, and especially I think overnight is a really good time to do this. So... Um, yeah, so it actually, you know, it's been shown it actually it's, um, creates oxidative stress um, when you're eating. So it is good to have a break. Okay, so let's jump into some of the different therapeutic diets. So the first one I want to show you guys, um, which you may have heard of, um, is the Mediterranean diet. So you can just see on my slide here, um, I've got the Mediterranean diet pyramid showing um, and you can see actually at the base of that um, pyramid is lifestyle. So um, actually being physically active and, you know, um, where you can. And of course, we're, we're somewhat limited in terms of, you know, socialising and having meals with others. But, you know, maybe we can do it virtually um, at the moment. But and then the biggest section at the base of the pyramid, so next going up is it's all fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, olive oil, um, nuts, legumes, seeds, herbs, spices. So that's really the foundation, the biggest part of what you should be eating on the Mediterranean diet. Next up is fish and seafood. Um, then um, a smaller amount, which you might have, you know, a couple of times a week, poultry, eggs, cheese, yogurt. And then right at the very top is meats and sugary sweets. So that's, you know, in the Mediterranean diet, they really very rarely ate red meat, um, is generally only on special occasions. So I would say just limit red meat to once a week um, maximum. Um, so also wine, um, you know, wine is drank um, occasionally um, on the Mediterranean diet. Um, and then also um, drinking water as well. So, and this is just, um, I've given you a sample meal plan, what a Mediterranean diet meal plan looks like. So you can see, Breakfast is like an omelette. You've got roast veggies and spinach. Um, lunch might be a quinoa salad with salmon and olive oil. Um, dinner might be a slow cooked vegetable and chickpea stew with brown rice. So you might have wild rice and snacks could be like nut butter with apple, um, sheep's milk yogurt with chopped fruit, a chia pudding or a protein ball. And so you can see here my meal plan is gluten free and cows dairy free. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's really, you know, and I've popped a note at the bottom there just saying um, to tr really try slow cooking and batch cooking. And that's especially relevant um, at the moment because we are, you know, dealing in, we're in this health crisis at the moment, we're all in lockdown. Um, you know, it's economical. It's a really economical way to cook. And it's, you know, you can, it means you can have, make a few nights worth of food and it prevents frequent trips to the supermarket, which is also really important. And it's delicious too. So cooking is, is beautiful, such a flavorful way to eat. Okay, so chatting about food intolerance now. So, um, so I've mentioned this before, gluten and cow's dairy are really common, but there are plenty of other things that can trigger symptoms and everybody's different um gluten and cow's dairy just are very common ones other ones that um you know i see are eggs so eggs can be an issue um but also things like soy corn like there's a there's quite a, a number of things that can trigger um symptoms so um a good way to work out what's going on for you is to use a food diary so to track your symptoms so you need to record be quite diligent for like at least a week record what you're eating record your symptoms your mood and try to figure it out you know try to figure out um you know if there's any correlation there anything that might be causing you symptoms and so if you figure out you are sensitive to something just cut it out completely there's no point in cutting down um, cut it out, remove it completely, and then, um, you know, cut it out for a few weeks or so and, you know, 
at least two weeks and then um you know you can try and re reintroduce it again and see if it you know if it is still causing you issues so the low fat fodmap diet this is is used a lot um in uh, women with endometriosis and you know when you've got gut issues um, and look there is a lot of evidence um, that you know there have been a lot of trials done studies done um, to show that you know that this diet can really um, help with symptoms you know like pain and bloating and things like that so the low fat diet restricts um, so it doesn't eliminate completely but what you do in the diet is eat less fermentable oligosaccharides. So there's, there's certain sugars. And so they're um, certain sugars, fructans, and um, of course, so they're found in wheat, onions, legumes. And then you've got disaccharides and so things like lactose and monosaccharides like fructose, which is a certain type of sugar, um, which is high in certain types of fruit and, you know, things like lollies and things like that and polypoles. Um, which again, another type of sugar, and this is this is commonly used for IBS. Yes. So really, what it involves is it's not a forever diet. So the low format diet, you do it for um, completely, you know, cut down, follow this diet, and then follow it for about two to four weeks, and then you slowly, systematically. It's best to work with a health professional on this, a um, nutritionist or a dietitian, and then you systematically re reintroduce foods and see. You know what's actually causing you the problem so just more on therapeutic diet so personalized diets for those with food intolerance so that's just you know um, yeah just figuring out and working out a personalized diet um, for you and then there's things like food chemicals so histamines um, salicylates sulfites like food additives so they can also cause problems as well um, now, SIBO as well, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. If you haven't heard of this one, this is actually a really common cause of IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. So it is actually quite common in women with endometriosis. So SIBO, basically most of our gut bacteria should live in the large intestine, not in the small intestine. And so what happens is, um, and there can be a range of underlying reasons and adhesions is one of those reasons which affects your, um, you know, your intestines and it just affects normal, the way your gut normally functions. So SIBO, um, yeah, what it can do is it, because these bacteria in the small intestine, they ferment, um, which is basically, they, you know, they're like eating the food um, that ends up in your small intestine. And because they're fermenting, it causes gas and bloating um, and all kinds of symptoms, really. So, um, so yeah, so it is best to work with um, a health professional on that one as well, because you may need, um, you know, you may need antibiotics or herbal antimicrobials. There's all different ways to treat SIBO. Um, another one is candida, so fungal overgrowth, um, and the diet there really focuses mainly on restricting sugars. Um, weight loss as well. So weight loss is important because, you know, um, excess weight can really contribute to that overall inflammation. So it's, you know, finding a healthy healthy weight um, where, where that's needed. Um, and also, of course, tailoring to the individual. So we're all different and... You know, there's no one size fits all when it comes to nutrition. It's about what, what's going on for you. All right, so let's talk about supplements. So first thing I would like to say to you guys is just to be careful with supplements, um, especially if you're on other medications because they can interact. Um, and also, you know, just think about if you're trying to get pregnant or, you know, if you are pregnant, you need to be a little bit careful with certain supplements as well, especially if you're going for surgery, please do tell your doctor. There are certain things that are contraindicated in surgery. So things like, you know, turmeric or curcumin and fish oil, really, they need to be stopped um, at least a few weeks before surgery. So always um, talk to your doctor. So 
Number one here um, I've got on the list, and this is not in order of preference or anything. It's just, you know, the way I wrote it, really. Um, so they're all really good. And it's not an exhaustive list either. There's a lot more supplements that I use in clinic. Um, but these are just some of the ones that I think are, can be really effective for pain. Um, so fish oil, um, which we want this combination of EPA and DHA. Um, so fish oil um, is really well studied for its anti-inflammatory effects and it's been shown to be really effective for period pain. So um, yeah, so in terms of the dose here, look, I mean, you probably want anywhere between one and three grams a day with fish oil. Um, so yeah, so fish oil is a great one to use. The next one is curcumin. Now curcumin is a constituent of turmeric, so it comes from turmeric. And I've just put a little asterisk here because um, I found it's really beneficial for both endometriosis and adenomyosis because it's been shown to lighten periods and that's really an issue, um, especially with adenomyosis is heavy periods. So curcumin is a great one there and it's really highly anti-inflammatory and antioxidant um, as well. So that is, um, so it's a really good one. Uh, the next one I've got is vitamin A. So vitamin A um, is really, really um, beneficial. Um, it really helps support the immune system. So, you know, it's vitamin A is important for a range of things. So um, it's important for vision, for immune health, for reproduction. Um, and yeah, and it's, look, I mean, it's really beneficial in the fact that it's anti-inflammatory as well and important for tissue repair too. So um, I found vitamin A to be quite helpful. Um, and the other one I've got here is vitamin E and vitamin C. And I've actually grouped these two together. Um, and so vitamin E is a fat-soluble compound. It's, it's a potent antioxidant and it's anti-inflammatory. And vitamin E and vitamin C in the study, so in a lot of studies, um, they seem to be grouped together and it's because they have this synergist, synergistic effect. Um, so they seem to work really um, well together. So yeah, so that's why I normally prescribe those two together. So zinc is another one. So zinc, um, I love for, um, for endometriosis and adenomyosis. Um, and zinc is, um, it's involved in so many reactions in the body. So zinc is um, super important in terms of our immune health, uh, but it's also anti-inflammatory. Um, it's an antioxidant and it really supports tissue repair as well. So, and um, so I think there's been a study that's shown that um, women with endometriosis are deficient in zinc. So, of course, this isn't everybody um, with endometriosis is deficient in zinc, but there was just a study done and it's found that this is, it's a common deficiency um, in women with endo. So, yeah, so good sources of zinc are really found in meat um, and poultry dairy products. And then there's some that you can get some zinc in whole grains, vegetables, nuts and seeds. So in terms of the dosage with zinc, so we do need to be cautious with, with zinc um, because you can't continue, you can't take high levels for a really long time. Um, but the supplementation really ranges from five milligrams um, anywhere up to about 40 milligrams daily. And continued, so melatonin. So this is a really interesting one. Um, so we know melatonin is really beneficial for sleep. So it's our sleep hormone, but there's actually been studies on endometriosis and melatonin. So it's been shown it can help in a range of ways for endometriosis. And the dosage they've used in the studies is 10 milligrams. So it's quite a high dose. Um, and it's been shown to have anti-inflammatory, antioxidant. Um, it's helpful for pain relief. Um, and, you know, of course, it can improve sleep quality, which is often a problem if you've got chronic pain. Um, it can reduce lesion growth. And it also has anti-estrogenic effects, which we know is helpful because endo is, you know, it uses estrogen to help the growth. So, 
So melatonin is, is great, but you, you will need to talk to your doctor about that one, um, especially if you're in Australia. And, you know, I'd say starting with 10 milligrams of melatonin might be a bit too much. So just start at a really low dose um, if it's something you're interested in, in trying. Um, so next up, um, I've got N-acetylcysteine or NAC for short. So N-acetylcysteine is, it's just like a protein. So it's a form of an amino acid cysteine. Um, and it acts as an antioxidant. And there have been a few um, studies, so two studies on, on NAC have shown real benefits for women with endometriosis. Um, and so one study showed that taking 600 milligrams three times a day for um, about three months um, was effective in reducing um, ovarian cyst size, so, so ovarian um, endometriosis cyst size. So. Um, yeah, so it it's also can reduce pain um, as well. So, so NAC is, it can be a really useful one. And I'm pretty sure though that's only available through prescription, so through a health practitioner. Um, so, yeah, but that, that is a good one. Now, the next one I've got listed, which you guys would have all heard of, I'm sure, is magnesium. So I love magnesium. Um, it's, you know, got such a wide range of benefits in, it's involved in so many things in the body, from energy production, but it's also anti-inflammatory um, as well. And it's very um, soothing. It can be really calming. Um, that's why it's also great to take it at night um, as well. And it's a muscle relaxant as well. So I'd highly recommend um, magnesium. And so the dose with magnesium, so you don't want to take large doses of magnesium. So basically what you would do, so to take a dose, you probably want about 350 milligrams. Um, and you could take that once or twice daily, but I'd suggest just starting with, you know, once um, daily in that glycinate or saturate form is generally um, a good one. Um, okay, so... Next up, we've got PHGG or slippery elm. So PHGG is short for partially hydrolyzed guar gum. So I'm pretty sure you can get these online or maybe from a health food store, but these are great for gut health. So um, they're really just forms of soluble fiber, but they're also prebiotics as well. So they're really nice to use. Um, so the next one I've got here um, is called PEA, and I'm not going to attempt to read the, the actual longer form of the name, but um, PEA is fairly new, I suppose, like when you think about it for treating endometriosis, it is prescription only, um, so you need to go through a health practitioner. Um, so it's used for chronic pain. Um, and, you know, things like um, nerve pain. So um, PEA has been shown to be quite helpful for endometriosis, but it does take a while to work. And that's probably is a common theme through a lot of um, things like with supplementation and with nutrition. It's not a quick fix. It won't make you feel better overnight, generally speaking. Um, you know, things like magnesium might provide some relief overnight, but generally it's, it's more of a longer term strategy. So I've also got here um, down the bottom, I've got um, progesterone. So I put in brackets Prometrium. So that's the brand name in Australia um, of natural uh, progesterone. And really, so what you would need to do is talk to your doctor about this. And um, it really can be beneficial for, um, really for, both endometriosis and adenomyosis. So, yeah, so I would say, you know, um, especially if you've got heavy periods, um, really heavy periods, progesterone, and, you know, if you are deficient in progesterone, then um, that can be a good option as well. Okay, so let's now, I'm just going to jump on. I've just got a couple of slides here um, about um, lifestyle and mental health. I'm really passionate about this. Um, it probably stems from the fact that I'm a yoga teacher as well, meditation teacher. Um, but I've found personally, like in my own health journey, 
that lifestyle and mental health, um, stress management is super important. It's as important as nutrition and all of the other strategies. So chronic stress um, actually disturbs the immune system. So it really contributes to inflammation. Um, and studies have shown that, you know, yoga and meditation can be really helpful for managing chronic stress. So, you know, we can't go to yoga studios at the moment, unfortunately, but, you know, at least we've got the internet and, um, you know, there is the opportunity to do online classes and practice at home as well. So, you know, but if those things, you know, you don't like um, yoga and meditation, you know, you prefer other things, like just find what works for you. Um, so practice self-care daily and um, have a routine and also um, build a support network. So, you know, we can't really go out and catch up with friends at the moment, but you can definitely reach out online. You know, you can find people, you can f find a support network through social media. You know, that's how I found Quendo. Um, and, you know, I'm now... Um, a volunteer for Quendo, have been for a few years now. And it's how I've met so many amazing women and really built a support network that way. So I'd highly recommend it. So I've just popped here, managing your thoughts and emotions are really key building blocks to improving your health. And they really are really, really important. Um, so, you know, a lot of um, nutrition and eating well and looking after your health, a lot of it is psychology. So, you know, it's implementing healthy habits. Um, so it takes time. So, so, yeah, so this is really important. And so next I'll just have a slide here on mindfulness. And mindfulness is probably the most researched form of meditation. And all it is is simply observing the present moment without judgment. So without attaching to anything it's just simple observation. It can be observing your breath, your body, can be listening to music, but really immersed in that music and listening to it. Um, so, and you don't need to sit and meditate to practice mindfulness. You can go for a walk and be really absorbed in nature around you. So, um, so mindfulness has been found to be effective for chronic pain. So it improves pain symptoms. It um, improves your quality of life. It's been found to even lower inflammation, which I find amazing. Um, and it's been shown to help anxiety and depression. So I practice mindfulness every day. So when I wake up, I'll just sit. I'll just sit um, as soon as I wake up and just observe my breath for about 10 minutes, um, observe my body. And yes, some days it's hard and I find, you know, my thoughts are racing and that's all part of it. So it's just the, the act, you know, just getting into the habit and actually practicing it is really beneficial. And so just another point here that um, people who meditate regularly um, actually process pain differently. So they've shown on scans that they actually, the way they process, so different parts of their brain light up. And they do this because they pay attention to the sensations of pain. And so that might sound crazy and it might sound counterintuitive, but I'm not talking about paying attention to pain and trying to practice mindfulness when you're in severe pain, because you're not going to be able to do that then. Um, you know, when you're in, if your pain is like a nine out of 10, then, you know, you're probably going to be in hospital. You're not going to be... Um, focusing on your pain, but I'm talking about more that kind of mid-level pain, like maybe, you know, it's a five out of 10, six out of 10. So that's probably when mindfulness um, will help you. Okay, I think this is my last slide on lifestyle. Um, so um, this one's about sleep. And you guys would all know that you know, if you're not sleeping, then it just makes everything worse. It makes you feel so much worse. So chronic illness, unfortunately, is linked to um, a reduced sleep duration and lowered sleep quality. So really what we want to try and do when we're going to or preparing to go to bed is focusing on relaxing the mind and body. And you can take supplements as well. So I mentioned melatonin and magnesium are both helpful. 
Um, and then there's also having something called sleep hygiene, which is really a routine um, that you practice before you go to bed. So all you do is, it's really about turning off all your devices before bed. So turning them off at least 30 minutes um, before bed and turning all the lights down. And by turning the lights down, you increase your natural production of melatonin. And doing something to relax you, um, whatever that may be. So it could be knitting, it could be reading something that's not too stimulating, um, could be having a cup of herbal tea. Um, so doing something to relax and avoid eating and avoid drinking alcohol as well. So before bed, because um, yeah, it'll just really help with your sleep. So that is, that's really all the, the content um, that I was covering today. However, I do want to share with you guys some resources that I've got. Um, so there is a free endometriosis um, meal plan um, ebook that I've got to share. And all you do is go to that website. So thehealingyogi.com, that's my website. And you just pop in your details and it just gets emailed to you. And really it's, yeah, it's a seven day meal plan. It's gluten free, cows dairy free. Um, so you get all the recipes and everything and there's lots of information in there as well. So just go over there. And so the other thing I wanted to share with you guys, because I feel like this is really um, important at the moment. So I do mentoring, I offer mentoring. And so really what the aim of mentoring is, is to really help you by offering it because it's one thing to know what you need to do. Um, but it's a whole other thing to actually do it and to make it a part of your life. And so I feel like people at the moment probably need um, some extra support. And I, I feel like as well that the true change really happens over a longer time frame than just a few weeks. Um, and it really requires a change in mindset and also habits um, to be successful long term. And so basically in my mentoring program, um, I offer my support as a nutritionist, as a health coach, um, you know, as a yoga teacher and a mentor. And I really draw on my own personal experience um, of implementing change and overcoming chronic illness. So that's really what my mentoring program is. And you can see just all the details, like what it involves. Like it's, you basically get one-on-one -on -one support um, guidance and education, there's nutrition, there's, you know, meal planning. So you get it, it's all customised, like personalised meal planning, um, personalised supplement prescription and monitoring as well. And I also um, involves, so I'll teach you about like how to relax basically, um, personalised yoga, um, you know, and mindfulness as well. So basically, so that's all the, what's involved on that um, slide there. So what, um, so you get an initial consultation, seven day meal plan, you get follow up appointments throughout um, the eight weeks, um, a relaxation coaching session, personalized yoga session and program, and also you get my unwavering support and guidance throughout. And so normally um, I charge $690 because it's, it's so time intensive for me because you've got me to yourself essentially for eight weeks. Um, and so, but because I know people are under so much financial pressure at the moment, um, or a lot of people have been impacted, I'm actually offering it for $347. So it's basically half price. Um, so there's only a certain amount of people I can take on um, because I do have existing clients. So um, yeah, so this is, it's really a limited offer just at the moment. And, um, I just wanted to put it out there for you guys in case anyone feels like they need that support. Um, so if, you know, I think this is an amazing opportunity. So, you know, if you are interested, please do um, contact me, um, send me an email to meastpal at gmail.com. So it's my email address. Um, and yeah, and as well, if you've got any questions about, um, you know, today's presentation, um, any questions at all, please do feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to help. And I also offer just one-on-one -on -one, um, consultations as well. My clinic is currently closed, but, um, you know, for in-person appointments, but I do see people over Zoom. So I do see people online as well at the moment. 
Um, so now what I'd like to do is just um, put it out there and see if anybody has got any questions at all. So yeah, so let me know if any of you guys have got any questions. So please, um, yeah, shoot, shoot those through. But if there aren't any questions, um, so, oh, from Zoe, how many supplements are too many? Could you alternate a few? And is it worth taking supplements sporadically or do they need to be taken daily to have an effect? Okay, Zoe, so let me just repeat that for everyone or hopefully you can all see this actually. Um, so yes, look, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule about how many supplements are too many. I am not a fan of giving people too many supplements, um, to be honest. Um, I usually, you know, usually like when I see someone, like I don't really want someone taking any more than, than like three or four supplements at a time um, because it's just, it's just too much. Like it's just, you know, I mean, it needs to be really targeted. And when you're just taking so many supplements, you know, it's hard to really then understand what's working for you and what's not. Um, and it also becomes just really expensive as well. So, you know, I listed a lot of, quite a lot of supplements today, but I would definitely not recommend someone takes all of those supplements at once. And the beauty as well um, about supplements is that, um, you know, we can get a lot of them now, we can get them compounded. So basically, you know, what that means is, you know, you can get a supplement and it's got all of those ingredients in, in the one container. So it's all been blended up into a formulation. So that's usually how I would, I try to do it. So I don't like people. Yeah. I definitely don't recommend taking, you know, like six different supplements and, you know, um, at once it's too much. Um, so, and is it worth taking supplements sporadically or do they need to be taken daily to have an effect? Okay, so this depends on what you're taking. But generally speaking, um, yes, you need to be taking them daily. And for a lot of them, it's you're talking months. You're taking them over a period of time, over a few months. Gen this is just a generalisation, yeah, because, you know, different, there are different supplements out there. Um, so yeah, so that's as a sort of a general comment, um, no, that I wouldn't be taking them sporadically. They need to be taken daily and, and usually over a certain period of time that's, and normally that would be prescribed or, um, given to you by your health practitioner. So I hope that answers your question. Um, does anybody else have any, have any questions? Oh, good. <laughs> Glad that answered your question. Um, Anybody else have any questions at all? Anything you want to ask or wondering? Okay. All right. Well, if, if not, um, I might leave it at that. I hope you guys have all found this really helpful and interesting. Um, and yeah, I hope, you know, you're all, staying safe and looking after yourselves, you know, during these, these crazy times. And, and thank you so much for taking time out on your Sunday um, to join me here. It's been an absolute pleasure, something I'm really passionate about. And um, I love helping um, women with endo and adenomyosis. So, so yeah, so feel free to reach out to me as well. So um, my email address is meastpal at gmail.com. Okay. Well, goodbye everybody. Um, <laughs> and great. Thank you, Zoe. I'm glad you, you found that interesting. Good. Got some notes there as well. All right. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye-bye.